Welcome to the Multifamily Millionaire Podcast, the show that interviews multimillionaire real estate investors and top producers in the real estate industry. If you're looking to create passive income and achieve financial freedom so that you can do what you want, whenever you want, you're in the right place. Our goal is to simplify and make real estate investing easy for you. For more information, you can find us at www.jlm.realestate. All right, everyone. So welcome back to the show. On today's podcast, we have Bob McGuire. He is the president and CEO of Income Property Advisors. I'm happy to have him here today. How's it going, Bob? Hey, Jason. Really well. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Um, I know we briefly talked about it a little bit, but can you tell the audience about who you are, what your background is, and what you do? Yeah. So um, we are a property manager here in San Diego. We primarily focus in San Diego County. We would say that uh, we're probably more multifamily centric than other property managers. We handle commercial properties as well, retail primarily and mixed use. One small industrial building. I've got Danielle here with me too. She's not on the screen, but she's in the background here. And so we got started in this in mid 2000s and you know, started kind of one-off managing some family properties. And then that kind of grew to third-party management. And at the time I had other partners that their families were active investors. So we kind of started with that platform and then built from there. And now we've um, grown to just under a thousand units in this county. We really got focused in the multifamily space over the last five years we have some bigger owners here in San Diego that we work with exclusively. So that's what kind of has kept us more focused in the multifamily area. Got it. Got it. And what was it that initially made you want to go into real estate? So I went to school in Colorado. When I got done with school, um, I grew up. So I split my time as a young guy going between California and Colorado. On one side of my family, I had some contractors that I was very influenced by that were big public works contractors in Northern California and San Francisco. And I'm from originally born in Marin County. And then my dad got transferred for work to Colorado and really grew up in Colorado, but come from a large family that was split. So in the summers, I would come to California and work in construction. So I liked seeing that. Then when I went back to Colorado and I got done with school, a lot of my friends, their families were in real estate development or they were real estate investors. And so that always attracted me for a number of different reasons. One, I liked construction a lot. I liked being around real estate development and I liked the independence of real estate and being able to build your own business and actually like have equity and ownership in a business rather than just go out and I wasn't the greatest of students. So I didn't want to go like to get an advanced degree and then, you know, go on the corporate track. It just wasn't my thing and wasn't something that, uh, that I could see myself doing. When I originally went to school, I thought I wanted to go to law school and then kind of found out what lawyers did. And my dad had a background and was in the publishing business. So kind of introduced my brother and I at young ages to different lawyers and judges and things like that, because he was in that, you find out the research and the amount of, you know, reading and, and just the day in day out kind of drudge of that industry. I was like, I wanted to be outside the office. Um, I always like to see things getting built. And so as I started to sort of pursue careers, my first job in real estate was working for a home builder. And he was one of the largest home builders in, in North America. So it was called Hallmark Building Company. I was the youngest guy and worked as an on-site guy and then basically got my own development. So a whole subdivision of homes that was about you know 2,500 houses that we sold with a team of one other, well, two other guys. And then we also worked directly with the construction superintendent. So we got to see houses built from the ground up. We were selling basically the lots and stuff and walking people around and selling their lot. And then they would pick a plan and so on and so forth. So that kind of naturally led me into commercial real estate because I was working in neighborhoods that were just getting built. So as you know, you know, being a commercial broker, the houses come first and then the commercial comes after it. 
And so once the rooftops went in, I had a friend of mine that was a shopping center broker and a retail broker. And uh, he introduced me to another friend, his older brother, and his older brother had a management slash retail shopping center, small brokerage company. And I went to work for them and came to find out that they were actually the in-house leasing for a very big shopping center developer. So that really kind of introduced me to management and it introduced me to retail. And then from there, I spun off into apartments. And so that's kind of how it all happened. You know, I've loved real estate. I still love real estate. I'd like to invest more of my time and effort into my own account in real estate. But um, I still think real estate right now, as far as other investments go, and the stock market, and just comparing the different investment vehicles out there. I'm very bullish on real estate. I just love it. I think it's by far the best investment. I think it's the only thing that's left where you actually still have real ownership in something, (laughs) you know? And that's something to be said in in this day and age. As you can see, there's, there's kind of this sort of social and cultural shift going on in the world. And I feel like real estate is a great buoy and a great place to, to park money and, and have security long-term still. Completely agree. I mean, um, love the story, love the advice. I'm very bullish on real estate myself. I think other assets just don't compare to it. I like on real estate, you can feel it, see it, touch it, right? Um, yeah. It's real ownership, like you said. But you're mainly in apartments now. Why did you decide to focus strictly on multifamily or, or mostly multifamily instead of sticking with the retail centers and the shopping centers? So that's a really good question. So the long and short of it is, is that, you know, I grew up in a town in Colorado. I grew up south of Denver in a city called Colorado Springs. And Colorado Springs, when I was growing up there, was kind of a mid, you know, you would say it was a a mid-city market, right? So it would be similar to like what Temecula would be to San Diego, right? So San Diego would be Denver, Temecula would be Colorado Springs. You know, it was a boom and bust town. And so you saw a lot of guys, you know, do very well. But then when the market turned, things got really bad, really fast. So for example, you know, when I started my career, and I don't want to date myself, but when I started, it was during the basically the collapse of the savings and loans. So I had just gotten out of college, similar to probably you when you got out of school in 2008 or whenever, and all of a sudden, you know, there's this blow up in real estate. So I experienced the same thing, but on a different level where it was commercial property and there was a creation through the government to um, resolve all of the unpaid debt and the bad bank loans that were going on in that time through a a corporation called the Resolution Trust Corporation. So a lot of brokers were working for that. And what happened was, you know, people got over leveraged on loans, banks were getting involved in these loans. And it's a long story, but, you know, we could talk about that almost on a separate podcast. But it's something that I saw and and saw people literally, you know, lose their life savings overnight. Um, There was a whole revaluation of real estate, There was also a lot of bad debt and a lot of toxic debt that was out there. And so that had to get restructured, whereas multifamily always stayed stable. It always had the best financing. It always had the highest amount of leverage. And it seemed like long term, the guys that were in multifamily were able to scale a lot faster and a lot more efficiently. So retail property, I really like it because of obviously the value Retail is typically like the highest valued real estate, right? If you're on the corner of like here in San Diego, you know, Fifth and Broadway, that's pretty prime real estate, right? So Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, the residential and the multifamily, it just always seemed to be very resilient and you didn't see the big fluctuations of the up and down. The other thing is from a management standpoint, commercial real estate, so office, retail, Not so much with industrial, but industrial has its own set of issues. They're just more complex to manage. Multifamily is very straightforward. You know, you as a multifamily owner know, you know, in your properties, you can pretty much budget like what your worst case scenario is for a turn. You can pretty much figure out what your CapEx is going to be over a certain period of time. I found with retail property, 
you know, a lot of the value of retail, like any type of commercial real estate is driven by the income, but also the front end, you know, to bring in a Starbucks or a Barnes and Noble or some of the larger retailers, you know, they have big tenant finish packages. They're very expensive. You have to step up a lot of the finishes. And so you start looking at those costs and what you're getting out of that. And it's just way more expensive to run. Whereas you and I, as smaller investors, we can scale a very large apartment portfolio very quickly and figure out very quickly what our efficiencies need to be and put those into place to grow. Whereas with retail, you know, you have a vacancy. You really don't know who your next tenant's going to be, right? It could be a number of different tenants and there could be a number of different costs associated with that. And now we're starting to see that more with office too. You know, office build outs are becoming a lot more expensive. They're becoming more customized and sophisticated. I definitely think after this pandemic, you're going to see office build outs become even more sophisticated from a standpoint of what the air handling systems are going to do, you know, what it's going to cost you to make some places that are going to be video rooms and this and that. So those are all very expensive costs and unforeseen costs that you really don't know how to budget for. Where multifamily is awesome because in my opinion, you get the best financing, you get the highest leverage, and you get the most predictable expenses Plus, the real kicker is out of all the asset classes of commercial real estate, it's the only one that you can truly go in with a business plan and execute on it and actually manipulate the value of that asset right out of the box. So if I'm buying at scale, and let's say you and I partner up and we go buy 100 units, you bring the money, I bring the management. Well, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to start going through the rent roll And I know where I can move rents. I know how I can move rents. I know that I could do almost a blanket rent increase, really, even with the rent control laws that we have. And if you think about, you know, on scale of 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 units, you start moving the rent 5% over five years, you've increased the value of that asset by 25%. If I can figure out operational efficiencies, I know that I'm going to make money. If I lose my retail tenant or an anchor tenant in an office building, I have no idea what that cost of TI or turn is going to be when I have to bring in that new tenant. And that's really hard to do. So I feel like it's a much more stable asset and it's a much more attractive asset. And that's why I love it to this day, you know? Yeah. I love multifamily because the math is so easy, right? Yeah. Um, it's so predictable. If I have a tenant that's going to move out, it's going to cost me a couple grand to you know, put some new paint, maybe some yeah. new carpet in, some new flooring. We're good. Yeah. Um, if Starbucks leaves, <laughs> it's going to be a nightmare to get that new tenant in there, right? That's right. Yeah. And even if it's a simple build out, Jason, you know, even if they're like, hey, we'll just take a vanilla box and you're like, okay, no problem. And then you go in and look at it and you're like, shoot, that bathroom's not ADA. <laughs> you know, so I got to go build a $10,000 bathroom just right out of the bat. And I can't tell you how many, so we, the retail guys that I work for, all we did was national tenant leases. So we didn't have barely any mom and pop type tenants. We had a few grocery store anchored centers, but even in those, with those locations, they were mostly national or very high end regional credit, you know, at the minimum. So we didn't have like the you know, ABC nail salons and things like that. We had very few. And it was always like the guys who actually had the mom and pops, it was a lot easier for them because they're like, hey, here's the keys. Here's the location. Kind of take it as it is. Do with it what you want. And I'll give you three months of free rent or something like that. Whereas the nationals come in and they're like, okay, so we want to have this build out. We need this power. We need this ADA bathroom. We need, you know, this type of flooring. We want this in. And then they're like, okay, then we'll bring in our trade fixtures. So you're always like, God, you know, it's going to be like 25 grand before we even see a dollar. So that was very interesting to see that they had, you know, big lines of credit behind all their properties so that they could constantly keep this going. Now, because they had such great locations, they had very little turn, but when they did have turns, the costs were astronomical, you know, and I think that's changed now. I think a lot of the big institutional type commercial locations are now operated 
by those institutional type users. So they're factoring that into their purchase. Their cost of money is much less than yours and mine. And they're able to sort of, you know, weather those storms, but there's still that risk that you have to deal with. In this day and age, you know, looking back on my career and when I did make the change that I made from being a retail broker basically to multifamily, I feel so fortunate what I did because it was right before Amazon. And now, I mean, if I was a leasing guy, I'd be like, well, at least I'm going to make a lot of commissions. But now there's a lot of vacancy. San Diego is a little different. It doesn't have the same vacancy issues that other cities do. But retail, as you know, nationwide is it's just kind of coming back now. And it got hammered over the last, you know, decade in a lot of different ways. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. Um, well, I'm glad you made the change. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you and me both. So you always have a very successful management company. What are some things you hear from your clients? Like, are, do they say the same thing? Do they also own some multifamily and commercial? And do they say that you know their multifamily investments are the the best investments they made? Or do you kind of hear a mix of things? That's a really great question. And Danielle's here. We have one client in particular that would be a really interesting kind of litmus test for that. One of our clients is in a partnership in a building in Kensington where Burger Lounge is and Clems. So we manage that. We just repositioned that whole thing. That building was purchased a couple of years ago from an old owner that had been a longtime owner of it and hadn't put a dollar into it. We repositioned the whole thing, retenanted the building. We did both the retail and the apartments. And lo and behold, there was a fire in the property, unfortunately in the back that damaged some of the building. So one of the owners is a retail owner and owns a lot of shopping centers. The other guys are apartment owners. And I got to say, like the commercial side of it has been really complex, you know, and really difficult. And it's a totally different animal. Whereas with the apartments, even in, the, in a, like a disaster like that, we had loss of rent insurance. We went and negotiated with the tenants, made sure they had, you know, their renter's insurance. We literally let everyone out of their league. We had everything solved in a matter of like days. Whereas the commercial has been a totally different animal. You know, the one of the commercial spaces that got damaged, you know, the guy brought in a public adjuster and this and that. And so in dealing with that and looking at the two types of ownership, the guys that own a lot of retail, if they're good at it, they like it, but there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of you know, difficulty over the pandemic. They've had to do a lot of renegotiation of leases. They've had to step back rents. They've had to renegotiate leases so that they can get rent paid back over a long period of time. Whereas us with apartments, you know, we've operated through the entire pandemic at about 98%. So to answer your question, I would say that my apartment owners are very, very appreciative and feel very grateful that they're in this particular asset class after going through what we went through. I think the guys that are in commercial, any kind of disaster, be it you know a global pandemic or a fire, it's just a totally different animal to dissect. Definitely, definitely. And your collections throughout the pandemic were at 98%, even at its worst? Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, we're fortunate, even across a large portfolio like ours. And we inherited a fairly significant portfolio over that period. And now we've kind of turned his stuff around and we're able to basically get his collections back in line. He had, he had some collection issues initially. Some was from mismanagement. Some was from pandemic type issues. But now the combination of helping the tenants understand where they could get help, um, us working out some payment plans and things like that. I was literally just looking today and we're now back on his portfolio. We're 97.6% going into the end of this month. So that's wow. good. So we've been very fortunate. And um, certainly if you asked me back in March, if we were having this conversation, when we're just going into a lockdown in California and when Danielle and I and Tom were looking at kind of what the forecasting was going to be for rent collections, I would have said we were going to be off somewhere around 40%. And that's what it was starting to feel like. But then as we got into mid to late April, everything kind of bounced back. And by mid-May, we were back to, we remained about the same from mid-May all the way through. And then for the SB91, you know, the rent help that was available to tenants that were falling behind, we had 
less than 10, probably less than 10 that took advantage of it. Some totally game the system. You're going to get that, right? So if you're looking at percentages, we would say 2%, <laughs> you know, Danielle's <laughs> holding up fingers. So we had, you know, that they just said, we're not paying rent. We're going to see what happens. It was a good gamble for them. We just heard yesterday, the whole state's going to pick up the tab. I don't know what that's going to cost you and I, but someone's going to pay for it down the road. So that's coming. But, you know, so from a standpoint of just the resiliency of multifamily, I mean, it's it's been amazing. Yeah, it was crazy how I was honestly pessimistic myself when the pandemic first hit. A lot of my clients were making offers like 30 percent below asking, trying to yeah. be the first sharks to uh, steal a property. And then April and May came and things just kept, you know, staying steady and rent yeah. kind of creeped up a little bit. It, it was crazy. I mean, knowing what you know now and how resilient apartments have been throughout this past year and a half, where do you see the market forecast in the next three to five years in San Diego? So, you know, you and I were talking a little bit before this, and I feel like right now, relative to any other California city, right? So if we're looking at the largest cities in California and we're staying coastal, so San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego. I feel like San Diego has been trailing those two cities for the last decade, really, as far as rent growth has gone. And now with the migration that's occurred, I'm really bullish over the next, you know, three to five years. I think San Diego, honestly, is going to be one of the hottest multifamily markets in the country. I could see it being very similar to Denver, Colorado. Denver is very similar to San Diego in size. Same with proximity to a major freeway system where there's a lot of jobs like central type, you know, middle of the country type jobs where there's a lot of regional hubs. San Diego has that same sort of employment base. Plus, we're starting to get a lot more tech. The one thing, Jason, that you and I didn't talk about, you know, San Diego 10 years ago and probably when you were growing up here, I don't know, are you from San Diego? No, I'm actually from San Francisco Bay Area, um, small okay. suburb up there, yeah. Okay, so you know that San Diego, I don't know when you came, I mean, it was always kind of known as a Navy town, right? And Mm -hmm. so it never really had the employment base that Los Angeles, you know, Los Angeles always had, obviously, the entertainment industry, but it's also a major finance hub. Myself being from Northern California, I'm probably one of the people that, you know, everyone thinks of Northern California as just tech, but yes, tech is a big part of it, but a lot of people don't realize San Francisco is the main finance hub for the Western United States. I mean, the Pacific Stock Exchange is in San Francisco. So it's a very big and always has been a big financial employer. And so there's always been a lot of money in San Francisco. It wasn't tech has certainly, you know, made it next level. But at the same time, San Francisco has always had a lot of wealth. And so San Diego is now starting to get the benefit of it seems like the tech in LA is now starting to look more at San Francisco or at San Diego. And we're seeing more San Francisco tech migrate out of San Francisco into San Diego. I told you earlier, you know, we do a little podcast. Ours is more news oriented and we've tracked some of these bigger tech leases. And I think that's a great thing. I also think the biotech is really starting to gain a foothold in our market. And so that's raising the level of jobs that we're getting. We're getting much higher paying jobs. We're getting much more white collar type jobs that are that require heavy education, things like that. So it's lifting our housing stock. You know, if you look around, the guys that are building these buildings, these developers, as you know, from being a multifamily broker, the Avalon Bays and the big developers out there, they're smart. They do a lot of research. They do a lot of demographic studies. And I think you're starting to see, yes, land costs are expensive. And there's a reason why we see a lot of class A construction. Certainly, that's one of the limitations of the land costs here in California. But also, they wouldn't be building it if they didn't think it was going to lease. And it's leasing. And we're seeing downtown. I honestly thought, Jason, downtown, I thought post-pandemic, I was like, man, there's going to be so many good deals downtown to snap up. You know, everyone's <laughs> going to bail out of that place and nobody has, you know, and now we're seeing that this new biotech hub is going to get built. We're getting better jobs, higher paying. The class A stuff has held very strong. And so I just think that that's a real indicator, especially for guys like you and I 
you know, if you're a BC owner, this is going to be a great five-year stretch for you because you're going to get all the rent increases that you're going to want to get. You're going to get a maximum. I just think vacancy is going to stay very low. Interest rates are very low. So it's a great time to refi. There seems to be a ton of money out there that's very competitive for apartments right now. So I just think it's going to be like, you know, kind of a golden age, really. I think we're going to have a really, really good run here in San Diego over the next decade for apartment growth. And I think some of the markets too, that are going to be interesting, you know, we keep an eye on a lot of the North County markets and what's going on there. We're pretty bullish on, you know, the markets that are East San Marcos, those areas are really starting to take off. And I think you're going to see more and more of that. You know, the coast is getting so priced out, but I don't know if we've hit our top. I feel like we haven't yet, you know? Yeah, that's a great answer. I feel like, I mean, I know you saw it when, um, when Blackstone bought the Conrad Prebis $1.5 billion portfolio in San Diego. I mean, yeah. I can only imagine how much research and demographic and population research went into that uh, right. purchase. So um, if they're bullish in San Diego, I'll be bullish on San Diego. <laughs> exactly. And the other yeah. thing is, too, you know, that's a very good point to bring up that portfolio. So did you get a chance to look that over and see kind of the locations of that? I did. Yeah. Like a majority was in Pacific Beach. A lot was in El Cajon. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So you have Pacific Beach, El Cajon. You also had down south, like down around um, Chula Vista and even as far down as um as down along the border. And so that was really interesting from a standpoint of their approach to it. You know, they're looking at it as value add. And I found that to be really fascinating. I was like, wow, that's really interesting. So they paid 1.5 billion, but I think they had like a hundred million um, that they were going to set aside for CapEx on that whole portfolio, which is really fascinating. So that tells you that, yeah, they definitely have higher level guys than you and I crunching those numbers. And they're obviously very bullish on this market because, you know, when you're investing that much more into CapEx, you've got to be thinking that you and I know that the rent control laws here, you know, you can only get to market rents when you're turning vacancies. So they must be thinking that, you know, either they're going to force a little vacancy or they're going to play the long card and they're going, hey, on our turns, we're going to move this, you know, over a period of time. I don't know exactly what their metrics are on the, um, you know, the IRRs they're trying to achieve. But I do know when you're putting that much more back into it that you're expecting to see pretty significant rent growth, usually by a factor of you're going to want to get at least two to one on each dollar that you're putting in. So definitely. Yeah. And that segues into my next question. Um, what submarket in San Diego do you like best if you're investing in multifamily right now for the future? That's a really interesting question too. I mean, so there's really three areas that we look at pretty closely here right now. So I'll, I'll just give you like what I think my top three are. So if I'm looking at the downtown market, I really like Barrio Logan. I think Barrio Logan is a really good place to park some money. I think you're following the natural progression of downtown. I think downtown is going to continue to be residential centric and you're going to see more. I think we just had our first office building in what, like a decade get topped off down there and it's already pre-leased, you know? So, I mean, the office market down there is really pretty tired and pretty lackadaisical, but the residential is really what's driving downtown. So I like that particular little sub market. And I like some of the things you can pick off there from a standpoint of, of value. I like La Mesa a lot. I think La Mesa is tremendously undervalued right now. I think people kind of miscalculate the rents. And I see a lot of OMs that come across from different owners that we have that um, we know that we can move rents a lot more than, than what typically is being underwritten. And La Mesa is a really interesting market because, you know, there's a lot of medical that's out there that people aren't aware of. And because of the traffic patterns and things like that, a lot of people don't want to that they now, it used to be that La Mesa was a commuter sort of city, but now it's really growing. And I don't know if you've been in the, the older part of La Mesa, but it's a very kind of cute, cool little spot, you know, and it's really coming to its own. And then North County, we're pretty bullish on the Tri-Cities area. So Oceanside, San Marcos, and uh, Vista. We really like Vista. I really think Vista is one of those areas that you can still find value 
And I think that over the next five years, you're going to see rents move a lot up there. Oceanside, I'm not so sure if it hasn't kind of topped out, but uh, Vista, you're seeing more employment moving that way. And Oceanside still kind of affected by the military base, right? So a lot of those dollars can only go to a certain level because of what's given for housing, you know, but the coastal Oceanside and Carlsbad, those are still really hot areas. But if, if I was looking at my top three, those that that would be the top three that I like the most. PB is always one of them, but PB is so picked over now. It's hard to find yeah. good deals. There's a lot you of competition too good in PB. Jobs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah everyone wants to be in pacific beach um yeah no those are all great markets i like all those markets a lot yeah i've seen north park take off a lot this year yeah like that market's gone from like 300 to like averaging 400 a door now so yeah who's there yeah it's amazing i just looked at a deal that was in university heights off-market deal 22 units super super good location and, you know, we were trying to make a play on it, talk to the broker, had him give me his rents. I looked him over. We priced everything the way that we thought it would be. Gave him an offer based on his rents, on his new market rent at slightly below a four cap. So call it a 385. And he was still <laughs> pricing it at like a one. You know, I was like, what the hell, man? I mean, that's crazy. but. I guarantee you he's going to sell it and somebody's going to pay for it. And, you know, that's the thing about apartments in, in these markets, like you said, I mean, that deal, we were offering what we thought was very high, like, you know, close to 300 K a door. And I'll bet you he gets close to 350 a door on super original. I mean, just not a dollar put into it over the last, you know, 30 years. And uh, that's the kind of deals that are trading in, in really A locations like North Park and University Heights, um, Normal Heights. It's interesting, though, the rent in those areas, though, parking is a factor. You know, these are non-amenitized buildings. There's no AC in a lot of them. So those are all things, you know, no laundry, usually a central laundry room, stuff like that. So those are all things that you have to think about. I'm curious to see how the market changes and what the expectations of tenants become as we start to raise, as rents start to climb more. I'll, I'll be curious to see what happens with those types of properties. But, you know, I have a great owner and uh, he's got a great saying, and that is you can't build an old building. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> it's true. There's a lot to be said for that. If you have older real estate, you have a nice low basis and you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about those problems. So you can always move your rents. You can move them up or down. The guys that are building the new stuff, it's pretty hard to have those meetings and start moving them down, you know? Yeah, 100%. So, yeah. And one other subject I want to touch on with you is a lot of investors right now are very bullish on building ADUs or accessory dwelling units by converting those garages. And obviously, that's going to take away a lot of parking in the central areas of San Diego that are already pretty metro and dense. So what do you see happening? Do you see that causing a, a stall in rent growth because of higher density and less parking there will be for those areas like North Park that, you know, a ton of owners right now are converting those garages into legal units? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, in some areas, so what you're asking is, do I see that as becoming kind of a deterrent to certain neighborhoods where they become overparked and you can't, you know, it just becomes too much of a headache. And yeah. so it detracts yeah. from rent and renters. I mean, so we've talked about this a lot in our office. So I'm sure you're familiar with what the city did in North Park, where they changed the parking on some of the main drags of North Park, but they still have a pretty good parking garage around there. I think the intention for the city is to start putting more of those parking garages around and to try and offset some of that. But certainly like we have an owner right now who's doing that in Ocean Beach um, his property is already under parked. We told him that we're like, look, you know, it is going to affect your main house rent because, you know, people that are renting a three bedroom, two bath, they're going to want parking for two car and he's going to lose one of those. So those are definitely going to become issues. But the counter to that is we're still so far behind on the actual number of housing units that we need for our market that I just don't know how much of a deterrent that's going to become. I honestly think people will kind of learn to live in the neighborhoods that they're living in and they'll 
they'll adapt to what they need to do. It's, I have friends downtown. We actually had a guy that we were working with on a project who was an, who was an architect who, who doesn't own a car. He lives downtown and takes Ubers to meetings and things like that. So I, you may see more of that, you know, with this starting to change. I think that's the intention for the city. And I think that's why they're trying to concentrate those types of projects where you get that density bonus to a transit oriented type situation where it's close to either a train or bus or, or something. So public transportation in some areas may become more heavily used than in other areas. But to answer your question, I mean, I think that in some neighborhoods, it could definitely have an effect. But overall, I do not think it's going to affect our market overall in rent. Got it. And to summarize, because there's such a housing crisis in San Diego already that even if all these units come to market and say, let's say there is less parking for a lot of the tenants, it still won't matter because we have a housing crisis in San Diego that's so that's so huge, right? That's what you're saying. Right. And, and, yeah. and so exactly. And so here's the funny thing, right? So unless everybody wants to live in a tiny home, right? So we're adding a unit. You have to look at unit counts as unit counts. If the number is zero and we need 30,000 units and we're only adding, let's say these ADUs, what sounds like a ton to you and me, they're only adding, I think like, you know, I think last year we did a podcast on it. Wasn't it like 800 permits or something for ADUs, which was up quite a bit from the year before. So we're definitely seeing like an exponential increase. But when you look at the number of what's getting built to what's actually needed, it's a drop in the bucket. And then the other thing that you have to factor in, Jason, in my opinion, is that even though you're adding these ADUs, that's gonna be for a single person. So you're a young person, Danielle is also younger, you don't see her here, but she's probably, you know, same age and, and she's married and younger and maybe starts planning a family. You're not gonna live in an ADU, you can live in an ADU as a couple, it's going to be tight, you know, and hopefully you guys like each other, but, but, <laughs> but, but as time goes on, you're going to want to get out of that. And that's where the housing crisis kind of starts. As you bridge out of that, you're going to be like, well, there's no two bedroom houses. There's no two bedroom apartments. There's no three bedroom houses. So it's always going to become kind of a problem. So until there's more construction, I think that there's this disconnect between what the state sees as being acceptable housing and what's actually really needed. And so I don't think that we're going to see any, any major increase that's going to move the needle enough to be like, wow, you know, rents are going to level off. I think that we're going to constantly see regulatory pressure and engineered basically rent abatement and rent control through the state and possibly even at the national level at some, that's what I'm most fearful of. If you ask me, what, what are you most fearful of that could affect rents the greatest in our market or in California? That's what scares me the most is the heavy handed kind of draconian laws that are being passed that have an effect on private owners, real estate, on their private property rights and how the state is basically engineering rents and telling owners how they have to deal with that. So I do think that you know, we'll see kind of an ebb and flow. And I think the ADU thing is, is a really good idea, but I don't necessarily, I think it's only one piece of what we need to do to solve the housing problems. Yeah, we could have a whole other podcast about the housing crisis and these crazy laws that people are trying to enact on private owners, mom and pop owners. So yeah, um, it's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's definitely crazy. Um, well, you're a young guy, you're building your own yeah. portfolio. I mean, think about that. Think about the roadblocks that are being put in front of you and how to navigate that. And, you know, I think the other thing is that kind of is, is a misunderstood thing is that uh, just because you're investing in real estate doesn't mean that you're some rich guy. It takes a long time to get to that. Real estate is a very slow and steady game. You know, you're burning off debt, you're having to reinvest into a lot of real estate, you're typically fairly heavily leveraged on the front end. So your margins are pretty thin, you know, to have someone come and say, Hey, Jason, you can only offer that unit for that price. It seems pretty unfair when you're taking all the risk. Definitely. And these lawmakers don't understand that. So it's tough to um, reason with them, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think that, you know, they have to look at it that, 
you know, I look at this eviction moratorium right now and it's like, you know, owners, all of my owners, regardless of what situation the tenant's in, nobody's out to like throw a tenant on the street. It's just not what, it's not what people do. People work things out and, and try and do it. Now, if it's something where it's really bad, it's hurting the community, you know, some guy's cooking meth in a bathtub or something, that's a different story. But I mean, this is, everybody understands that there are human conditions right now that are going on that somebody needs to help that everyone's willing to kick in and help. So these are the things that get misunderstood. These are the things that affect the housing and housing has become very politicized. And I think that the way that it's being portrayed is that landlords are bad. It's just not the case, at least not in my experience. And I know it's Definitely. not yours either, you know? Definitely. Yeah. You're hundred percent correct. Switching gears a little bit here, I uh, just wanted to ask you this question for sure is one of the worst mistakes you made or one of the biggest mistakes you made in real estate. And um, how did you learn from that mistake or experience? There's been so many. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that's a really good question. Probably the, I would say if I looked back on my career, you know, when you're ready, if you're in real estate or you're focusing on a particular asset class and you're not feeling like you're getting anywhere with it. Like I said, I was a retail broker. I always had the idea and the dream was to build my own real estate portfolio. Still working on that to this day, feel closer to it now than I ever have. But when I was in retail, I just knew that the retail market was shaping and changing so quickly to become an owner of regional or any kind of retail that was you know, worth long-term value of owning. It was just so hard to do. So my advice is, you know, go find the asset class that you like and specialize in it and continue to work at it, but make sure it's something that you can like realistically scale into. It's pretty hard in this day and age, unless you raise family money or you come from an already built sort of real estate portfolio to go out and like say, oh, I'm going to go out and assemble office buildings. Or I'm going to go out and buy, you know, regional grocery store anchored shopping centers. You can definitely do it. There's definitely a value add play to it, but it's probably not going to be the same as what you can do in the apartment world. You know, the apartment world is something that you as a single owner, me as a single owner, we can go out and assemble a fantastic portfolio of real estate that rivals institutional type ownership. And you may have to put the ownership in place, like for me, build the management platform but at the same time, I think that some stuff, I probably spent too much time on something that I didn't really, my heart wasn't into, you know, and my heart's really into this. I love multifamily real estate. Just love it. So I feel really fortunate that I found this when I did. I'm glad you're in the space and um, looks like you're doing really well. So it's good stuff, Bob. Yeah. And then in case there's someone that's watching this, that wants to be a manager themselves. How did you kind of you know, grow your company to the size it is now and, and what business decisions kind of got you to this point in your career? That's a good question. I mean, we always looked at it as long-term. So the way that I looked at it is, you know, I did not come from super wealthy family or, you know, a family that already had a real estate base. So I knew that I wanted to own real estate. I knew that I wanted to build a management platform where I could learn how to run real estate really well and then start just building my own platform and folding it into our third party platform. And that's kind of what we've done. We've gone in and out of deals and things like that. We get into a lot of syndication things. We've now invested in stuff out of state. But to answer your question, I mean, if somebody wants to get into the property management world, you have to, I think, first and foremost, it's good to come from like your background or my background where I was lucky because I started with a construction background and then that went into a real estate brokerage background. And then from there, I ended up in being an in-house guy for a large owner. And so I saw both sides of the transactional side of real estate and what the decisions actually really are for the owner and why not no offense to you. I know you're a good broker and, you know, but brokers definitely tend to look at what's the end game of, you know, it's a transactional business, right? And for these guys there, it's building blocks to a portfolio that, that they're trying to put together. So the decision-making in-house was very interesting to see in the whys and how it affected financing and different decisions too, that you're not necessarily thinking about when you're on the transactional side of things. 
and also being able to run other people's real estate and learn from really good investors, you know? So to build up to a place where you can become a good manager, I think you need to get into a certain aspect of real estate or come at it from a financial standpoint. I don't think you're going to transition well into this business if you're a teacher and you say, hey, I want to pivot into property management or something like that. I think you need to start with a real estate base and have a love of real estate. If you don't, there's a lot of stuff that you got to deal with daily as a manager that you're, you're not going to like, you know, and that takes a different type of personality to just kind of look at things and pivot to it and resolve it and move on to the next thing. So I would say one, have an understanding of what you want to do and how you want to run it and what's needed to run it. Um, two, there's great specialty things. Go out and get your CPM or something like that. And three, maybe have some tra transactional or construction background in real estate and understand the, the finance of it, the numbers. I think if you do that, you'll want to, you'll be able to fit into one of those areas and, and do very well with it, you know, but I think you need one of those four areas for sure. It's great advice. I definitely do agree with you that you should definitely have some sort of real estate background when you're starting any sort of real estate business, right? Yeah. You can't come from, uh, being, like you said, being a teacher and just start your own brokerage, right? It's kind of tough to do that. It is. It runs yeah. stuff too, because you got to make decisions on the fly and you got to be confident in your decision, you know? Yeah, for sure. I know your time is valuable, so we'll kind of wrap up here, but um, what is the piece of advice you would give to a newer investor who's looking to buy his or her first multifamily property here in San Diego or any market in, in the U.S.? If I get probably is, you know, the same thing that was given to me and probably the same thing that's given to you, probably the same thing that you tell your clients today. And it's, it's the oldest thing, in the, but it is location, 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 right? So if you're going to go out and buy a piece of real estate, make sure it's well located, make sure it's going to achieve what you want it to achieve. If it's somebody that's new to the business, I would say sit down and especially if you're buying a multifamily asset, sit down and really think about your business plan. Because as you know, you know, you're not just buying, when you're buying an apartment building, you're really buying an operating business. And so you have to look at it from a business plan aspect. So number one would be get the right location so that you have the right demographics and the right tenants and the things that you want to deal with. And number two is sit down and really think about your business plan. Is this a short-term hold or is this a long-term hold? And those are two different things, as you know, you're going to go into them with a totally different set of ideas and different expectations, depending on what your hold time is. Definitely. Yeah, that's great advice. I think location is definitely the biggest thing. Multifamily is very street by street. All right, Bob. Well, thank you for the great interview. It's been a pleasure talking to you so far. My last question is, where can people learn more about you? So you can find us online. We are uh, obviously San Diego Property Manager. Our company's name is Income Property Advisors. Our website is ipasd.com. So would love to hear from, from anybody and uh, certainly enjoyed meeting you today. And this has been great. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks for your time again, Bob. And um, hopefully I'll talk to you soon. Okay, take care. Thanks, Jason. Take care. Thanks, Bob. Thank you for joining us on the Multifamily Millionaire Podcast, the show that interviews multimillionaire real estate investors and top producers in the real estate industry. We're here to help you create passive income and achieve financial freedom so that you can do what you want, whenever you want. We'll catch you next time on the Multifamily Millionaire.